It depends. You first have to look at the digital economy in terms of whether you are talking about sectors that embody digital specializations or whether you are talking about specific industries that are native to the digital sector. I think, um, by and large, considering the proliferation of digital technology into agriculture, warehousing, everything that we do, the consensus seems to be that you have to look at what is native to digital, otherwise you might be talking about the whole economy and you might not be able to zero in on the specific areas of focus. The numbers show that, for example, in the United States, whereas the economy at large may have grown at about 1.5% um, between the years 2008 and 2016, the digital economy was growing at about five times that pace. And this has been the trend across many parts of the world. You see that the um, platform companies, the what are typically called the funds, the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Google, um, these companies have redefined the GDP, the output of the United States. So when you talk about the 17 trillion or so dollars that is the output of the United States, you see that the valuation of an Apple alone today is looking at plus a, uh, upwards of a trillion dollars, depending on the day you are looking at. But that's the valuation. That's not the same thing as the output. But if you look at the um, revenues, you also see that the revenues of these companies are beginning to represent a sizable chunk of the U.S. economy. You are talking upwards of 5%. So at, under those circumstances, when you also mirror that against what is going on in China, and you see that it's almost like back to back, each company is replicating itself somewhere within the Chinese economy. So you see um, JD, Alibaba, um, Huawei, you see that back to back with these US um, companies, there's also a Chinese equivalent. And that seems to be the innovation engine of the world. So it's important that as we set the context, we look at what these things mean for us. The IMF as well looks at the digital sector and estimates it at about 10% of many, many um, modern economies today. I'll come to what we are doing, but under those circumstances, you find that the broad range cuts across uh, hardware manufacturers, cloud hosting, telecommunication, content, mobile app development, everything that comes to bear when you talk about a sector that is adding value. And the numbers are staggering, considering the age of the sector as well, because um, many of these economies are actually still run by founders. Many of these companies are still run by, by founders. It's industry. And you take a company like Heineken that employed me for seven years, and at the time that I was there, we were in the fourth generation of the Heineken family. I'm sure by now they are probably in the fifth or somewhere there. But we are talking about companies that are founder-led in many cases. And even in the cases where they are not, for example, in Apple, Steve Jobs died probably six, seven years ago. I'm not sure the exact year, but it's not that long. And considering the impact that these are making, we have to bear in mind that it's not a journey that we can opt not to be part of. It's something that we really have to um, spearhead in our part of the world as well. So now if you look at the other side of it, which is what they call the sharing economy, it's also becoming very interesting because um, there are a lot of WhatsApp stories that many of us may have received about companies that do not have the normal asset base, the normal balance sheet of old organizations. So Airbnb does not have uh, hotel real estate, but the sharing economy has allowed it to become a big player in the hospitality space. And um, in this country as well, you realize that that has gained traction. Uber does not buy cars, but today I think it has become 
commonplace for us to talk about in terms of also the innovation because it gives you more security when you send your teenager out on Uber than when you say stand by the roadside and stop the next car that is painted yellow. Those innovations are important to be able to spearhead growth because there's a whole industry coming out of that. I don't know whether we all notice it, but um, maybe it's not the best example, but that's the one I can use. My favorite bakery is in Kwabenya. I, I lived in Kwabenya for 10 years, but in the last two years, I don't live there anymore. So I called a neighbor there and just jokingly, I said, today I'm not myself, because if I was in Kwabenya today, I would have gone to the bakery for hot bread. And she said, oh, but that's not a problem. Who we'll, we'll buy it to you? I didn't understand till then that that economy has also picked up. All they have to do is to buy that bread and you know, arrange it, basically, and then you get it. So those economies are also churning out other forms of growth, which we would not have had before. That bakery is now serving me where I live, whereas in the past, somebody would have had to go there physically to go and buy the bread. So that is the opportunity that we speak of. But that is all in the, in the sense of the context. If we bring it home, I work for MTN, that was said in the introduction, and I want to make a certain link so that we see the opportunity there is at home as well. Last two weeks or last week, MTN published the 2008 performance, the results of the, the financial results of the company. You would find that for the year, it was a little over 4.2 billion Ghana cities in revenue. On the back of that performance, you ask yourself, are Ghanaians talking that much? Uh, is, is, is there that much going on? But 17% of that revenue is mobile financial services. It was launched in 2009, but up until about 2014, the adoption was very low. And then all of a sudden, it is there. And that is major value creation on a number like what we are talking about. There's data which, I mean, even in 2011 when I joined MTN, it was like we close the meeting when you're about to disperse, then somebody says, oh, there's an update on data. Because it was not really meaningful in terms of the size of the business. In fact, during the introduction, the conversation, the, the bit that, I, I, that, 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 that stuck in my mind was when they referred to my days in Tigo. Because the whole of, <laughs> anyway, maybe the numbers are um, not necessarily something that everybody is free to share, but the whole of the data pipeline for Tigo at the time was four megabytes per second. And we contracted this, I see Mr. Duchum in the, in, the, in the gathering, he was the chief administrator of that platform. But we, we contracted this for the whole subscriber base of 4 million people, and it worked. Today, on a mobile phone, people want 6 megabytes per second, 7 megabytes per second as they are experienced. But that was the national pipeline at the time. So we've come a long way in that sense, in terms of the telecom opportunity. And having said that, what then must we do as locals to be able to also participate in what is going on in the global space? So Ghana's digital economy, if we look at leadership, technology, and culture, we will be able to fathom what exactly is needed and what is lacking in, a, in the roadmap that we need to craft. I will look at technology first. And what I can say is that the mobile platform itself is pretty standard now. I mean, you have people who are trained in the University of Science and Technology, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, apologies, and they at least will recognize a mobile switch or a packet for the traditional technologies that are in the mobile network. So that may not be our challenge. But when you are talking about technology today, the challenge is in network management at a higher level, let's call it. We are talking about application management at the user experience level, not necessarily just the program level. We are talking about enterprise architecture, where you have to have an appreciation of the overall. You see, some of the conversations that we have in um, our national discourse 
are constrained by the fact that sometimes you are not speaking about the architecture. So there's a big conversation going on because maybe there's a crowd at a certain health point today or there's a certain um, registration exercise going on and there is a bottleneck today. And we take a lot of measures to try to resolve what is going on based on ad hoc. Now, when you talk about architecture, you are talking about identifying the long-term components that have to mesh to be able to resolve what is pending. And that conversation requires a certain set of skills. Business intelligence. What is the value proposition today of Facebook? When it started, it looked like they had lost their way. Why would somebody invest infrastructure for you to share your pictures? And like each other's posts and so on and so forth and it's free but out of that the resource base that facebook has built is unparalleled in the world you can go on facebook create a campaign to say i want to sell old towels and immediately it will start to tell you that in the neighborhood that you live in let's take Kwabenja again um, there are so many males, so many females of this age, of that age, because there are two billion people on the platform. And by the most extreme estimates out there, the world is 7.7 .7 billion people. So if you take out the fake accounts and all that kind of thing, it's a huge platform. And out of that, people are building whole businesses, because instead of shooting wide, you can now look and see that the customers you are looking for are actually roaming the street at the moment. And if you need to invest, put salespeople out there right now, and that might be your moment. And this conversation is enabled by a certain set of skills. You cannot go from just deploying, uh, let's say, payroll programs in pharmacy shops to building the Facebook platform. It's, 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 it's uh, streets apart. The two, the two worlds have nothing in common. But that technology base is also something that we have not necessarily addressed in the um, curricula that we speak of today because we are still talking about training people quite traditionally. And if you train a traditional computer scientist or you train a, a traditional management information systems professional and you go through the traditional commonplace theoretical foundations that build that, you might not end up with an architect, you might not end up with a business intelligence professional. It is a partnership with industry that produces the output that we are looking for. And industry is interested in this because the generations are important. I have another example I use that we, we had a project we were doing and at the end of the project, the application we were building at work seemed okay. According to the requirements that had been laid out, everything had been done, the right people had resourced the project. But every time that it went out for testing, the feedback was that it doesn't roll. This is not how the consumer wants to feel it. Then we had a few young people come in for national service. And one day, just out of, I think, a few people not being available and so on, they were asked to join the meeting. They were just smiling the whole time because they were like, this is not what, these are not the tools that they use. There's nothing wrong with what has been built. There's nothing that you can disqualify as the tools that were used to build it. But if you go that route, your experience will not be the same as something that is built by young people who are dealing with the current trends and using the current technology. So it has to be redone. These are not conversations we waste much time on because the youth know what's, ha what's happening. And they have to be empowered to be able to come and do these things. But that partnership is important because if you sit in industry and you don't have that other leg in the academia where the young people are being trained, then obviously we miss the boat. On the other hand, if the academia also does not have the roots into industry, then you try to put everything in a curriculum where certain things have to be practical. And it is that conversation that it represents an opportunity for us. One of the things that I want to point to when we are talking about these things, just to show that it's not technical, it's not a conversation that is high up there and so on, is in October 2016, the Wall Street Journal reported that AT&T had made an $85 billion offer to buy Time Warner. The question you ask is, 
why would Time Warner cost $85 billion? Now, for those who are 49 plus, like myself, <laughs> you would also recall that much earlier, America Online had bought Time Warner. This was about 15 years before this offer. So, America Online bought it, and then America Online, that part of it, AOL, collapsed after the credit crunch, and it was Time Warner that stood. The relevance of this is that the world is moving to content. Warner Brothers has made videos, has made movies from the beginning of time. And that kind of content is what people are paying this value for today. AT&T is one of, I mean, maybe apart from China Mobile, they might be the biggest telco in the world. But the future is in investing in content. The infrastructure for people making phone calls and browsing alone, if you are not part of the higher end of the chain, where people subscribe to the content, then you are missing the boat. Because in fact, for a lot of the young people, they want the, what now we now call the telecom pipeline. They want it free of charge. It's only possible to subsidize it if you are able to be a player in what they are actually accessing. They go online not because they want to be online. They, they go online because they want to see a video, download a song, play a game, do something, or research an item, and so on and so forth. The way we have structured this conversation in Ghana, the technology is moving in, let's say it's moving west, and the economy is moving east. Because what is happening in Kumaud, what is happening in the music industry, what is happening to the musical platform, there is where the innovation sits. In fact, in the United States, when the World Trade Center was bombed, after the, the, the Department of Homeland Security had been created and all the structures had been built and so on and so forth, Hollywood was also brought to the conversation to imagine what else Al-Qaeda can do. Just imagine. Because that type of attack had never happened before. An aeroplane had never been flown into a building. But the silly things that you see in movies at the beginning, that's how satellites were created. Somebody dreaming about a cartoon said, somebody talks towards the sky, and then the sky reflects his conversation to another person's house. And everybody laughed that, yeah, that makes it fun. But today, that is how satellites work. So it is that creativity that we have rubbished by redefining creativity as comedy. So you see a creative person, and the response is to laugh because that's what they are for. They are for pure entertainment. Somebody else has polished it up, given the right delivery platforms to it, and is creating $85 billion of value. What we are saying is that we have confidence in the industry today that based on the fiber optic cables that have been laid out, based on the mobile broadband that has been done, based on the service delivery platforms that have been deployed, based on the billing platforms that are out there, that Ghana is ready to be able to put content in a way that can be monetized. But what are the structures for that conversation? Who are going to be the distribution partners? Who are going to say that out of the music that has been created over the last 10 to 20 years, this is the actual value of it. And therefore, if you want to contract the people, you can distribute it for two pesos per song, three pesos per song, the same kind of model that iTunes and Co are doing. And then you create real value. And trust me, the youth are probably in a different direction from where we think they are. Because as far as we are concerned, we are looking for the next lawyers, we are looking for the next engineers, the next doctors. So if we don't grow the hospitals and grow the factories at the rate at which the people are being produced, then we are in despair. And the conversation becomes, where will our children work? Yes, the economy has changed. When I left Kumasi in 1993, Valko interviewed me on campus. Valko gave me my letter on campus. So I went for national service, fully equipped that this is a, but Valko is not there anymore. And yes, it can be recreated under different models, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but people will graduate the same. And a lot of those people are doing creative work at the moment. When I need something, I talk to students, and they build it. They, they, they tell you we can put this together, put that together, this is how this technology works, so on and so forth, and they do it. But in the real conversation, if we do not see that as value, if we do not see that as a growth opportunity, 
And then we are building a different world from the global economy that we aspire to join. And our journey then becomes that we visit the global economy to borrow money and try to alleviate poverty bit by bit. But we never want to go to the high end of the chain. The high end of the chain takes innovation and creativity. So technology, we discuss in that framework that you put it in place in order to be able to do distribution, to be, in order to be able to do electronic commerce in ways that are meaningful to this society. I give you the last example about this contextualization. You see, when you go to the when you go to Yendi, when you go into the palace of the Yana, it is a very traditional environment. And in fact, you see that there are cattle and so on and so forth with the hay and all to give you that context that you are coming to royalty that transcends generations. But when you enter the court, you see one of the most beautiful surveillance systems in the world. And you know that all along, when they were ushering you in and so on and so forth, security personnel were tracking, and they have the dashboards over there. Now, I asked an engineer once that if this contract was given to me and I asked you to go and deploy this, how would you approach it? Because normally, when you are deploying technology, there are a lot of signatures. I've done this part, come and sign, you are the owner. If anything goes wrong, you sign. It's not me, it's you, and so on and so forth. Would a Yana sign in that technology deployment? So it means that you yourself have to know what the culture is. You have to know what yes means. I cannot sit in MTN house and compete with Ajima and the, 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 the figures of the market that he understands is very difficult. But this trader, this partner, M. Hawks, he looked at it and he said, well, leave it to me for two or three weeks and then let's meet again. In those two three weeks, he flew to Guangzhou in China, looked at the manufacturing, he had conference calls himself with MTN head office, discussed the vagaries of what the route to market were going to be, and so on and so forth. And then he said, let's launch. Tomorrow we'll launch. The conversation is about partnership. Because if somebody spends their whole day in a room, and then I go there on a market visit, and point to this, point to that, point to that, write a report, make recommendations, change one radio on the cell site there, and then we are done. I cannot proceed into a room without the gatekeeper opening the gate. And it is those conversations that are important. Because today, like I said, conventionally, we are not trained to know that the returns on our training rest in our appreciation of the Ghana Union of Traders. Their membership is probably almost 3 million registered. Pension contributors in this country is less than one and a half million. So the formal sector that we know versus a population of 30 million, it's up to us if we want to operate with that in mind as the ultimate, then you are going to touch less than 5% of the economy. If you are going to operate with Osoka in mind, Mokola in mind, Salaga Market, Kedetia, you are going to be able to do more. But those conversations, must feed into our training so that we can put technology in to make them more efficient. And that is what we are doing. So leadership is about that. There's a lot of hard work involved. People have to take the task. And we also have to think global. Because, like I said, our traders and our partners in the traditional part of the economy are thinking global. They are part of the Alibaba story. They are part of WeChat. They are not in favor of uh, the China versus US battles. Those are theoretical for them. If it is what they need is on the Alibaba, they go there. If it is on Amazon, they go there. And they are neutral in some of these matters. Whereas the intellectual component of the society likes to go into the abstract. So let's also go into the abstract. I unfortunately. I have to mention that the day that I was making these notes, I put down the name of Kwame Deji, famous philosophy professor of the University of Ghana. And hours after I printed this out, I heard that Kwame Deji was dead. So looking at the paragraph now, it makes me a bit sore that um, 
may he rest in peace. There's another philosopher called Atuse Kyoto, and he speaks about, he has a, a publication called Left Universalism Africa Centric Essays. Now, he speaks about what he calls an apartheid of values. So, people believe that the People believe that individualism. Exactly, that's what I mean. Sometimes they feel that it's an Africa. So Africa has been cast as communal. Through that, we've had experiments like Ujamaa in Tanzania and so on and so forth, which have been costly but not that. But what the likes of these philosophers, philosophers are saying is that by the agency of individuals. Traits like, traits like greed, etc., are in every culture. And it is the role of the custodians of laws and systems to contain them. Additional to that is that when you refer to the works of Franz Fanon, great liberation writer, philosopher, Fanon Kachi, who I just spoke about, which are profiled around who we are as Africans, you begin to realize that autonomy and individual agency part of our culture. It has always been there. The idea that we are only communal and only suited for cooperative work is also plaguing us because you begin to think that if people are striking out as individuals and becoming successful, it is alien to us that we need to quickly average it out and make it a small piece for everybody instead of the reality of the matter is that Eight people in the world, eight people, Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, even Michael Bloomberg, his father, and so on, they own the same wealth as the bottom four billion people in the world. They are eight, and the other group is four billion. Now, unemployment in America is still at an all time low. And Innovation is being rewarded disproportionately versus other contributions. Philosophically, this sounds morally extremely controversial. What is that? Does anybody need a translation of that? He's not talking about selfishness. He's, he's talking about individual agency. So individuals being creative and lending their support to others who can also create value out of that. Using that basis, you look at some of the statements that others have made on our environment. In 2011, Jeff Timmons, who at the time was CEO of General Electric, said that we see Africa as one of GE's top growth regions moving into the coming decades. When I was a student, General Electric was not in Ghana. Today they do a lot here from healthcare, they, they actually were part of the tender for the concessionaire, and so on and so forth. And it comes from statements like these where people actually see value in a location. And it's up to us to show that we have the infrastructure to marry it. Today, Google is a Ghana with artificial intelligence. Does anybody understand why they chose this location? It's because what we are talking about is the merger between biology and technology. If you look at the writings of the guys like uh, Jeffrey Rifkin and so on and so forth, they are now talking about the fourth industrial revolution the measure of technology and biology. Human life must be understood to be able to get value out of technology. This is of artificial intelligence will be in all of that, a society that understands life, but do we? So we need to capture that. There's a specific research on Ghana by a writer called Hamid Kaya, which is titled, Multinational Companies and Local Micro Businesses at the Bottom of the Pyramid in Ghana, a fair deal for business as usual. So that deals with the specific tracks of the culture and how it interacts with the corporate culture. It's a difficult conversation as usual because for many people, in fact, what I found was that when you Google now for something like multinational corporation, it normally takes you to literature that is about 12 years old because there was a time when the world was polarized and um, in fact, I, I, people 
people used to caption the multinational efforts. So that was when that language was used. Now you talk about a corporate and people understand it. Because in the shares of that corporate are the investments of the pensioner. So the vulnerable people have a stake in the performance of these corporate entities. To get their culture, and I specifically chose culture along those perspectives for a reason, so that we know that culture is also modernity. But to get there culturally, we must embrace business. We must look at the enablement of the allies. And that's those ones I cannot name. But there are certain places you also go, and you realize that the traditional ruler has lost the youth. So the whole festival has become meaningless. He comes, he reads his speeches, etc., etc., etc. You meet the youth in the evening, and they are sitting somewhere. Saying that, uh, well, he's doing his thing. That marriage is important for everybody to get growth, for everybody to get synergy. It's not over. Technology can enable a lot of that. And it's interesting that in this discussion, if we want to talk about leadership for the digital revolution, then it's leadership that connects to the society, leadership that grows the society to great value. So, out of all that, I can only make a few recommendations, and then I end. The recommendations. I will not explain because we talked about it. I think one, we need to create some large organizations. We need to move away from just micro organizations. Two, we need to articulate the leadership vision that will adapt who we are to a digital equilibrium with systems. Who we are in equilibrium with systems. Three, we need to create the skills building curriculum. And institutions required. Skills are involved. It's not a joke. Or we need to have ethical procurement of technology and infrastructure at optimal cost by efficient processes. That one I want to unpack because in there are a lot of conversations. But ethical is important because every technology procurement is an opportunity. If you overprice it, if you get it wrong, Watch it, a generation is lost. Five, we need to have deliberate implementation of the correct digital architecture to match identified problems. This one I'll explain. You see, as part of the telecom work that we visited places like Singapore Telecom, Telecom Italia, Telefonica in Spain, and so on and so forth. One of the conversations I find interesting, when we left Telecom Italia, I asked the guy that, what is the profile of your revenue? How much is voice, how much is data, how much is financial services, broadband, so on and so forth. And he told me it was 30 at $10. Nobody's going to buy it. So you have to do it by internal skills, agile young people, coaching, mentoring, the things that we are talking about. And it is this process that I'm talking about, that's why I explained that deliberate implementation of the correct digital architecture to match identified problems. Last but not the least, and no, second to last, nurturing of innovative cycles of entrepreneurs, youth, and vibrant citizens. Small businesses must be encouraged. Okay, sector efficiency, technology deployment, if we don't do it, small businesses suffer. Yesterday, I myself had to go with a colleague a, 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 more or less a relative to solve some issues at the revenue authority because most of the time bosses have to be involved at the various levels. You know, you have to speak to a district manager, you have to speak to because you go to the front line and because there's no technology, because there are no systems, they start to manhandle you. And that is important that we solve it so that small businesses can thrive. The last one is what was already said: defeat the semi-communal. 